I know Roger from real life, um, where he does cool things like sailing and photography, and he's generally a gadget kind of geeky person, <laughs> as self-described. But in his professional uh, life, he's a director at Sun Labs, and he's going to talk to us today about uh, the Sunspots project. So uh, please welcome Roger. Hi. So today I'll tell you a little bit about Sun Labs, where I come from, how we work and what we work on, and uh, then I'll tell you about this cool project that I like to talk about called Sunspots. Um, Sun Labs is the research arm of Sun, so we're not the product group. We don't build the standard products. We uh, do the forward-looking stuff, and the, the key thing is that we're here to take the risks, so to do the projects that may fail. So we do high-risk, high-return projects that we think are interesting uh, things to sort of help set directions for the future for the company. And we have a quick three-step three process for doing this. We come up with good ideas, we innovate, we uh, build them, we demonstrate, and then we transfer them to the business unit where they make money off of them. That's the theory anyway. It turns out that you can have a bunch of really smart people and make it really easy to come up with good ideas. And they can even be do good at doing things and, and be able to build the cool stuff. But actually turning it into products is the hard part. Um, Sun has a kind of an interesting way of doing this. What we do is we overfund the labs a little bit so that instead of, in many places, the labs are sort of begging for money from the rest of the corporation. But in Sun, we sort of look at it as the lab's job to put those business units out of business. Right? We're trying to come up with the new things that, that uh, help them along. So, so we want to have our own separate funding. And sometimes, actually, the money flows the other way, where we will take a project and we'll fund it as it transfers into a business unit. So you get to transfer the knowledge, the prototypes, the people, and some money to support them for a little while. So as a manager in a business unit, you don't have to make a decision. Should I take this new thing? or? or keep doing what I'm doing that makes money. This slide basically tells you that what I just said there is a lie, um, at least 40% a lie. What I described is sort of a major part of what we do, but we also do other stuff. Um, this section here, the 15% community thought uh, and thought leadership, that's an area I call keeping the world safe for sun. It means sitting on standards committees, doing open source projects. Um, publishing papers. And that section in particular is growing dramatically. So this is pretty out of date. Now most every project has some phase or part of it that is open source or relates to uh, community and thought leadership. And that's a lot of what we do in labs. Um, sometimes we come across an idea that just doesn't fit in with the rest of Sun and its current business. And uh, so in order to get it out there, sometimes we have to start what we call a micro-business unit. Sunspots is an example of that. Okay, we in labs went and acted like we had a little new start company. Our small group of people went off and we designed the box, we designed the industrial design, we built the hardware, we take care of manufacturing, we did it all in our, our little group and acted like we had a little startup company there to, to do the entire thing and take it to market ourselves. And we do this not necessarily because um, uh, we want to. We usually do it because we have to to get something out there. And uh, you know, right now the Sunspots isn't a great business. It's not the kind of thing that's going to make Sun a lot of money. So we don't want to distract our business units with it. It's something that we're focusing on for other longer-term purposes. And I'll, I'll tell you about that. We take our work very seriously. So uh, you guys have lots of places that sort of look like this. I just wanted to let you know that our place, you know, we have fun too. <laughs> The reason that I came to Sun about four years ago is because basically everybody that I interviewed with was smarter than me. And I mean, it was just incredible. I'd sit down for an interview, and these people would come at me with these questions and everything. And I was so impressed. I just wanted to be around those people so that you know, through osmosis, you learn more. And um, we've got six of Sun's. So, so our group is, is about 150 people out of 35,000 in Sun. and. Um, of that group, we've got six of Sun's fellows. So those are the highest uh, ranking people on the technical ladder. So these are fellows, are the, the folks that you kind of bow down as they go by in the hallway. And it's people like Whit Diffie, who's the co-inventor of public key cryptography. You may have heard of the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. 
that's him, or Radia Perlman, she invented the tree spanning algorithm that makes routers work. Without her, there's no internet. So our, our joke with her is that the internet has many fathers, but only one mother, and that's, that's Radia. <laughs> anyway, it's a really cool group. Um, our little group is responsible for 12% of Sun's patents, uh, which is proportionally more than you know, we should have given our small numbers. But on the other hand, it's interesting to note that 88% of the patents come from elsewhere in Sun. Sun really takes innovation seriously, and it happens throughout the company. Um, we believe in slave labor, so we have lots of interns. We're very open. Most everything that we do, you can find out about at research.sun.com. And I mentioned the funding. We've done some cool stuff. You may have heard about Java and things like that. We've had a pretty good track record of getting our stuff into products that get out there. Everything from pieces of chips to, um, you know, to, to things like Java. And it's kind of interesting working for a labs like Sun because um, at Sun, we build chips in Spark, the Spark chip. We build uh, systems, computer systems. We build storage. We build uh, an operating system, Solaris. We have a language, Java. We have applications like OpenOffice. We've got pretty much everything you can imagine that relates to computer science or electrical engineering. It's all fair game for us in lab. So it's, it's lots of fun. These are the kinds of things that we're working on right now. Um, we're working on systems that allow chips to talk to each other uh, at very high speed for very low power and not generating a lot of heat. Turns out that wires are the problem there. And it makes people want to build bigger and bigger chips so that they don't have to use wires to communicate between the chips. Well, we've got a way uh, to make it so that you don't actually need the wires. You get the chips to communicate by just putting them very close together, just a few microns apart, and they form a little capacitor. You put a charge on one side, and the opposite charge shows up on the other chip. And this is communication. And you can do this at gigabits per second. And in fact, you can do it at really high density, really high speed, and uh, not have some of the side effects of generating heat, uh, slowing down your speed, and, and, and those sorts of things that happen in chip-to-chip -chip communication. But you, don't have, you also avoid the uh, other disadvantage of, of building larger chips, which is that the yield goes down and they become very expensive. So it's, this could revolutionize, revolutionize the way that computers are built uh, in the future. It's pretty interesting. We do lots of stuff in system software, Java, 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 Java. We've got some people who kind of know a thing or two about Java, so we do lots of Java stuff. But we do other languages, too. We have things like in um, Fortress is a, a, an open source um, scientific computing language uh, that we're uh, developing. Uh, we have an open source system for uh, gaming, building multiplayer online games called Darkstar. Uh, we have an open source storage system that's a, a very large scale uh, distributed storage system that I learned a new word because of this system, and so I will allow you to impress your friends with this. It stores yada bytes of information. <laughs> Terra, peta, exa, zeta, yada. Yada is a lot, it's a big number. Uh, system science, we do uh, uh, work in security and so on. There's, there's a, a lot of. Uh, System, system science is kind of cool because it's that place where we get to put together all the stuff that we know about with, uh, um, from chips to applications and everything in between. And then networks and clients, and the, the project I'm going to talk to you about now is, is this one here, the Sunspots project, that's uh, just one of those, those projects. So Project Sunspot came about because um, We've been very successful with cell phones, getting Java on cell phones. We're, uh, I think, 2.2 .2 billion cell phones or something like that now. Um, but if you think about it, there's only 6.5 billion people in the world. We're up to 2.2 billion already. So we kind of got a limited market left, you know? So we have to think about what comes next. What's it going to be? What's going to be the thing that instead of having one per person, maybe you've got hundreds or even thousands per person, right? What's that going to be? Well, we don't know what that is, so we designed a development platform that we call Sun Small Programmable Object Technology, or Sunspot, that's basically a system for a, a development platform for people to invent the next cool thing. The idea of it, the design point is, 
something that will inspire people to build cool stuff. Right? Because we don't care what it is that gets invented. As long as they do it with our technology, then someday, maybe down the road, they might pay us for it. We're, we're willing to suspend disbelief. Come on. No, it's, 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 a, it's a great thing. We just want people to use this technology, get out there, and invent cool stuff. So what is a sunspot? Basically, we put together some interesting technologies or stuff that we thought was interesting. One is it's embedded. We want to think beyond the keyboard, mouse, and screen and think about stuff that lives out in the world with you. It should be easy to program. So we made it Java top to bottom. This system is Java all the way down to the metal. So you write your device drivers in Java. You do everything in Java. So if you're a Java programmer, you know how to program this device, and you can do whatever you want with it. It's connected. It's got wireless communication built into it. So it can communicate with other things around it. That means, uh, in our case, it can do mesh networking, uh, and as well as over-the-air programming. So you can program it uh, over-the-air in, in, in situ. It's mobile. It's got a battery, so you can take it with you. You can move it around. It's not tethered to anything. And then one of the key things, it's aware and active. And what I mean by this is that we put sensors on it, right? It's about being able to sense its surrounding. It's about knowing more about what's going on in the world than your average computer and being able to do something about it sometimes. So for example, in robots, where you move things around. And then of course, we're big on security, and we think that anything that people are going to play around with, uh, that eventually they want to have some business outlet for it, it needs security to be thought of from the beginning. So we've built that in. The system itself has basically three parts to it. The battery, the main processor board, and the application board or sensor board. The main board is a 180 megahertz ARM9 processor. It's got half a mega RAM and four mega flash. And uh, this 802.15.4 radio, if any of you have heard of Zigbee, it's a new up and coming sort of low power, uh, short range, low speed uh, communication uh, mechanism. We use the same radio, although we have a slightly different protocol than Zigbee. Uh, there's a USB interface for charging and so on, and, and then it's got the, the battery, as I mentioned. Uh, it's a lithium-ion battery uh, connected to it. The eDemo board has a bunch of sensors on it and things like that, so you can know about the world around it. And uh, I'll pull one of these things out here so we can take a look at it. So this little board here, this is a sunspot. And the little board that's on the top here is the, the application board with the uh, LEDs blinking on there. That uh, board there has a three-axis accelerometer, so it can sense motion in all three dimensions, has a light sensor, a temperature sensor, has these eight LEDs, because LEDs are just the coolest thing. <laughs> Geeks love LEDs. Um, push buttons, got a couple of push buttons so you can you know, interact with it, and then it's got ways to connect up to other types of sensors and other devices. So it's got six analog inputs, five digital I.O. lines, and four digital outputs. And then to top it all off, you program it all in Java. So this is standard Java like you have on a cell phone. It's uh, uh, CLDC 1.1 for those who care with an IMP profile. It's basically just like a cell phone, only without a display. And what this all means is that you can do things like this. My, my son, when he was either seven or eight, I forget now, um, asked me about this project. What's the Sunspot thing all about, Daddy? And so I spent a weekend with him, and we wrote a little program. And we just used the accelerometer here to sense when you swing this back and forth and to blink the LEDs, and we got this. It says, hi. <laughs> this is a sun spot. <laughs> OK? That's done with the skills of a manager and the attention span of an eight-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did in the labs is we put this together into this kit. And uh, we built this little, this little kit. Like I said, I'm, I'm extremely proud of this stuff because our little group you know, had to even design the box for this. And, um, so this kit has, uh, and we've aimed at sort of an education 
market uh, mostly for this, uh, education and research, uh, where we've got a couple of the devices as we have there and one that acts as a base station. All that that means is that it doesn't have a battery in it and you have to keep it tethered and it can you know, connect you to the internet and stuff like that. Um, but you get all the software and tools and a bunch of little gadgets along with it. And on top of all that, it's all open source. So I'm talking about everything here. We're talking about the virtual machine that it's built on. We're talking about the drivers. We're talking about all the demo applications. And a ton, there's a ton of those and, and things that are built on top of that, and even the hardware. And in fact, more hardware than you get in the kit. So these are the two boards that come in the kit, the main board and the uh, e-demo board, which is just sort of a demonstration of the kind of thing you can connect to it. But we have other boards, like these prototyping boards, a uh, high-speed serial board, uh, SD flash board, uh, a um, uh, EDAC board that's uh, for high-quality data acquisition, uh, and, and other ones that are all open source and available to anyone to, to go off and build. One of the cool things about this is, of course, other people jump in and start building stuff too. And so we've got a pretty rich set of things that people are building out in the world. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, putting these together and seeing what people say about them. Uh, and so I'll just toot our horn a little bit. Embedded.com likes us and says that it's the fastest prototyping platform available. Uh, top 10 amazing Java applications by Java Lobby. Uh, Editor's Choice Award at the Maker Fair. Uh, the number one must-have gadget <laughs> for the discerning geek. All right, so we're just for the discerning geeks, according to InfoWorld. And uh, we just recently won this thing called the Sun Innovation Award, which we're, we're pretty excited about. All right, so yeah, sounds interesting and all, but what does it really do? Um, what are these things good for? Well, this is, uh, this is kind of gives you some idea of what they can be used for. Obviously, they're for prototyping gadgets or building things. They've been put into toys. Uh, they've been put into a rocket that we launched up and were able to monitor as it was flying up in the air. We put them into a balloon that went up to 100,000 feet. They've been used by the government to keep track of uh, deep, dark secrets. Uh, I'll show you this one, just because it's fun. They've been used in robots. Uh, we put together grids of them. Uh, they've been used in art projects that took over an entire hotel in uh, downtown San Jose for the Zero One Festival. That was kind of cool. Here's an example of uh, something that a student did down at the Art Center College of Design. So art students are really cool because they don't care how it works. They just wanted to do something, right? This guy wanted to build a swarm of blimps, OK? He wanted to kind of hang out and go to hang out like, like fish and swim around together. And so he put a sunspot with some little uh, motors with propellers and so on. And these things can zip around the room. And, and he, he did this really cool thing where he used a cell phone vibrator on the side of the uh, of the uh, the blimp, and it makes this really cool eerie kind of whale noise. It kind of goes <laughs> echoes around in this big room. This guy um, has kind of made a career out of this. Now th he did this as part of a class uh, where they had lots of other amazing applications because art students come up with some of the most creative stuff. Um, but. Uh, He's been going around doing art openings and everything, and even was featured in Make Magazine on the cover of Make Magazine with the, the, the blimp bots, the attack of the blimp bots. Uh, definitely fun stuff. These have been used in robots. So for example, there's a company in, uh, in Utah that's built a robot that uh, is completely um, sunspot based. So the, they sell this platform, and you plug in your sunspot, and it's got a, a spot for brains. Um, and uh, it's basically you know, got a bunch of sensors in it and a nice uh, track tread system so you can drive it around. And we've been playing around with a lot of those and, and doing sort of swarm behavior kinds of things. This actually, it's, it's kind of interesting how things like the, the, um, the, the guys with the, um, uh, the art center guys got us thinking about this sort of swarm behavior stuff. And, and what happens when you've got a lot of things sort of cooperating to get to some goal. And uh, with the sunspots, we've had lots of interesting applications for that since they, can, they, uh, uh, they have the radios to communicate and they can sort of cooperate to do stuff. Um, 
my son last week actually was at the summer camp and he built this trebuchet and we were throwing stuff around in the backyard because that's what dads do with their kids, you know. And um, he said, well, I wonder how many G's it takes when this thing throws this. And so we got out of sunspot and, sunspot and started throwing it around the backyard. And, and, and now we know that it's just about six Gs, which is about maxes out the sensor. Um, <laughs> and in this case, for example, this throw, uh, this periodic spinning here is the thing was spinning around and the, 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 um, it was spinning in such a way that the accelerometer was off center slightly. And so you get this periodic motion of the centrifugal force of the, the uh, spot spinning there. And we know that it spun six times. Um, We've got this cool thing called the modular data center. This started out with the idea of if we, what, what's the biggest computer that we could sell somebody? And one of the things we started thinking about there uh, was, well, first of all, it has to fit into a shipping container so you can move it someplace. And so why not make the shipping container the data center, right? So, um, so we've got this thing called the black box, or the modular data center is the product name of it. And when it was first introduced, um, they, we were having lunch with one of the engineers. And he said, boy, you know, we could really use sunspots because when this thing is turned off and driving around on the back of a truck, you really don't know what's going on with it. You don't know where it is. You don't know if it's being dropped. You don't know if it's out of temperature range or any of that. Sunspots are sort of self-contained. You could just put a bunch of them in there, and it would take care of it. So we put. Uh, sunspots with, we hooked up a GPS to a sunspot and a cell phone so it could phone home. And then we monitor temperature and humidity and light. And we even built some hardware for it, the data logger board that I mentioned that's open source that we, we have available. That, that board we built for this project. And the cool thing is we did all that and had it up and running in two weeks. So it was a complete network of devices monitoring this thing. And they were even time synchronized so we could tell, do rigid body simulations of this thing uh, as it's running down the road. And we actually found a time when they did drop it on us. So <laughs> that was kind of fun. And the cool thing was, since this was in there, we were able to do things like um, uh, they wanted to see how this thing held up in certain environments, like in an earthquake. Right? So, what, what happens in an earthquake with this modular data center? So they put it on this giant shake table down in San Diego. And this thing can, can simulate, I, I guess they were doing the Northridge earthquake. And that was like 6.7, something like that. And, it, and it's big enough to build a house on. So they put this whole modular data center in there. And they let it bounce around. And we had um, sunspots in there to see what happened. and so. The camera in here kind of shows you. They were doing an experiment, by the way, with leaving the top uh, things off these racks to see what happened. And it turns out it's a bad idea. But this is what it looks like inside a data center during a 6.7 earthquake. And the spots were able to record data and uh, tell us what's going on. Sunspots are also used to collect data. Now, this, we, we have this side interest. Yeah, it'd be great if, if the whole world ran on Java. That'd be, that'd be wonderful. But we know that it doesn't. And uh, so even if somebody takes a Sunspot, builds an application, and then decides not to use Java, we still want to do this project. Because a lot of the projects that people come up with are about collecting data. And that data needs to be stored somewhere, needs to be processed. And, and guess what? You know, we're, we're happy to help you out with that. We got the machines to do that. So we're looking at lots of projects uh, that are just about collecting data, like uh, monitoring water quality in Malawi, Africa. There's these guys at um, KTH in Sweden who actually are spearheading this project uh, to um, um, help warn the residents of this, uh, this town in Africa when the water is not fit to drink. It's a simple enough thing. And uh, you know, just putting the right sensors in the right place and collecting the data and telling people can save lives. Of course, these other guys have higher hopes. They want to save the planet. Um, these are the gro these guys from uh, Warren Wilson College in North Carolina. And uh, they've got a project down in Panama. Their story, I'm, I'm going to take a second and tell you this story, because it's, it's kind of a fun one. So these guys. Um, wanted to do something in Panama. They're, they're, <laughs> this is Professor David Abernathy. Um, 
And this is Chris Fustings. He's actually an intern of ours now because we met him thanks to this project. But uh, David Abernathy um, told me that Warren Wilson College is kind of seen as a hippie college. So I actually Googled hippie college, and the first hit is their homepage. It's not even like something saying, oh, here's the list of hippie colleges. It's their homepage. So I guess they are a hippie college. Anyway, they wanted to do something to monitor data in the rainforest and, and so on. And so they, they got this idea of doing something with, with sensor networks and, and so on. And so they, they pitched something to the Panamanian government saying, hey, could you, can we have a grant to, to go do this? And, and they got the grant. And so they said, oh, huh, we, we got the grant. Now what do we do? Well, they started looking into this sensor network stuff and found that um, they went to a, a company that, that had some similar kinds of things like this. But they're, they're, uh, when they went to that company, the company said, all right, here's what you do. You, you take your five top grad students and you sign them full time to the project. You'll probably get PhDs for all of them out of this. And then they'll be your experts on this Nest C stuff, which is this programming language for this, because then you, you'll have a bunch of undergrads to support them. And uh, they'll have to you know, learn from the graduate students and, and, and support them. And so you'll probably need you know, about three times as many of them and so on. And, and David Abernathy at this point is going, well, OK, guys, um, we don't have a graduate program. We don't even have a class in C, much less this Nest C stuff you're talking about. And then he found out about sunspots. And he said, well, we do have a class in Java. And so he and five undergraduates have done this project. And they're monitoring that they're, they're working with these biologists. They're monitoring the, the rainforest canopy and down on the ground and looking for differences and looking for what changes as they move towards places where there's deforestation problems and so on. It's very interesting. A little closer to home, um, Sun is right here next to the Dunbarton Bridge. And um, all around us, there are these salt ponds. And the USGS is recovering those, to turning them back into wetlands. And when I found out about this, I said, whoa, we got we to gotta talk to these guys. Because um, we, we found out that they're doing a lot of scientific stuff to try and figure out how these changes affect the populations of animals and things that are in the area. So that it's, it's, it's fairly complex what they're doing. It's an ecosystem they're manipulating. And what they uh, normally do is they send grad students out to put in some sensors, and then they send them back in a month to get the data out and all this. And we said, how about, since it's right next door to us, how about if we build a network of sunspots and monitor what's going on there? So that project is underway, and it's, it's pretty cool. This one's kind of fun. We gave a, a, a kit to the University of North Carolina, and we didn't hear for anything from them for a month. So we sent them emails, everything OK? They said, go to our website and check out this video. So this is the video we saw. That's an autonomous helicopter, and it deploys sunspots. So that's a sunspot you see falling down to the ground. And so this autonomous helicopter can fly to predetermined places and drop sunspots. And then it's got another sunspot inside the helicopter that can communicate with the ones on the ground. And so it can spread them out and get the data from them down on the ground. And this is cool, you know, like if you're studying volcanoes or something like that, and you really don't want to go in there and deal with that stuff, this is a, a great way to do it. Um, these guys in the Netherlands actually take sunspots and tape them to the backs of their swimmers. I literally duct tape. And from the side of the pool, then they can monitor what the swimmer is doing. So this woman, as she goes and swims along, they actually have a live feed of the data going along with them uh, as she's swimming. And they can see if she's tilting too much, if she's changing her pace, or the pace is wrong, or if she's uh, uh, you know, taking breaths at the wrong times. They can actually see that in the data. And it's, it's a pretty cool application. Now, we just had one that was flying and one that's exercise. So if you put them together, you get Mike's flying bike. Now, this was kind of cool. We just found this video on YouTube. Uh, didn't know this guy at all. But what this guy did is he took sunspots and he made his bicycle fly. And you guys were involved. Um, what he did is he took his sunspot, which he's holding up there, and he instrumented his bicycle and used Google Earth, uh, the flight simulator, so that he can, from his exercise bike, 
fly around in Google Earth and actually, you know, move around. So he's got it set up so that, like the handlebars are instrumented so he can tell which way he's steering them. And the, he's got uh, these extra little drumstick things. I don't know what those are. They the probably control ailerons and stuff. And then the, the wheel is instrumented so that he can tell how fast the wheel's going and, um, and all that. And then he, he just wrote an interface to take all that data and act as a uh, keyboard and mouse to his computer. And then he can fly the flight simulator. I think this is really cool because you know what better motivation is there for doing your exercise than if you stop pedaling, you'll crash into a mountain. <laughs> So I think he should have to pedal faster to take off. I don't, I don't know about this. But anyway, this is SFO, and he just uh, lifts off and, and heads out over the Golden Gate Bridge, I think. Um, I love it. <laughs> See, I think we're getting closer to that thing where there's going to be billions and billions of these things out there, trillions. Like this one is a surefire winner. This guy had this dog named Sadie. We, we tried really hard to get him to change the name of his dog to Spot, but he wouldn't do it. So Sadie is his dog, and he wanted to know, when he goes off to work, what does the dog do at home? So he set up a webcam to watch the dog, but the dog was never in the room. <laughs> so he put these buttons over here, and he can press the button, and it plays out a sound saying, come here, Sadie, and Sadie comes. <laughs> well, if she'll come, he can also make her do tricks, right? So he can make her sit and roll over. It didn't take long till he figured out that this is kind of a mean thing to do to his dog. <laughs> so he took his sunspot kit, and he hooked up some servos and things to it, and built a little device that will dispense treats. So when the dog does her tricks, he presses the reward button, it opens up the door, and dispenses a treat, and we're all good to go. <laughs> My favorite part of this whole video is the fact that what happens now, he presses the closed door button, and the dog is gone. <laughs> he never will find out what the dog does while he's off at work. OK, so this is some guy, uh, Bob Beasley, who's um, he, he actually learned Java six months before he started this project, so we, we like this one, too. He's, he's a, an interesting guy. I got a chance to meet him. Um, and you may be saying at this point, yeah, 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 OK, well, this guy, Bob Beasley, he's like a genius, right? Because he can build stuff that you know interacts with his dog and all that using sunspots. Well, let me walk you through something that's basically topologically equivalent to this. So he's got some servos hooked up to his sunspot. He's connected to him over the radio. Let's do that same sort of thing and build a robot. OK? So I've got uh, a little robot here. And uh, basically, all that it is is just a few different parts. It's um, some servos like you get at a hobby shop for a model airplane or something like that. There's some tires connected to them. They're, they're servos that are continuously rotating, so they, they keep working. There's a little box for some AA batteries. And there's a sunspot and some wires to, to hook it all together. And that's, that's all that makes up this, this robot. The wiring is pretty straightforward. There's three wires that come out of a servo. This is looking right at the back here. There's these three wires coming out of each servo. The black and red ones are for power. And the yellow one is for control. So you, you connect the black and red ones up to this battery box. And the yellow one, basically, you hook up to the sunspot. Turns out you also connect the red and black ones so you've got a common ground and things like that. But I assure you, it's easy to wire up. And I can have any of you doing this in a matter of uh, minutes. OK, so now we've got a robot. All right, all right, so the hardware is easy. How about some software? How many folks here know Java? OK, well then, let's take a look at the code. Here it is. This is the whole app. You bring in some, some uh, libraries that we provide you that know about things like servos and the I.O. pins of the, of the demo board that they're connected to and all that. And then you define a method that's a standard Java method for a midlet that says, um, which is the, a, a cell phone kind of application. It's like main, you know. And uh, 
And so you, you define that, which is called start app. And then you go through and you say, give me an array of pins. This font doesn't show, but that's actually an array thing there, of pins by going to the eDemo board, get it, getting the instance of eDemo board in the sunspot, and getting its output pins. Right? So we now have an array of output pins. OK? Well, let's say that there's a servo connected to pin H0 on the board and call that left servo. Let's say that there's a servo connected to pin H1, and that's the right servo. And then let's tell it to move. Not rocket science. So that's the code. And um, I don't have a horizontal surface to run this on that's up high enough for everybody to see. But basically, uh, we extended this a little bit where we use um, uh, this. Uh, oh, my battery seems to be dying on this guy. Let's see if this works. Um, where uh, I can take the accelerometer data from this one. So, so you guys all know the Earth sucks, right? It's always accelerating you towards the center of the planet. So with this 3D accelerometer, I can sense how I tilt the sunspot in my left hand, and I can send a message over the radio to the device on the right and build a little gesture control robot. So as I tilt forward, it goes forward. I can turn left, turn right, back up. And you'll just have to, those of you in the back can have to, have to imagine that you can see this. It's driving around. And so it uh, has a fun time with the carpet here. Um, so we've got a little gesture-controlled robot that's about to fall off the podium. Um, cool. It's just wires and hot glue. In fact, there's no circuit to de design, no transistors, capacitors, any of that. It's a software project. It's a high-level software project. right? This is a Java project. All those of you who raised your hands earlier can do this. And you can do it pretty quickly and pretty easily. Um, so, in a nutshell, that's what Sunspots is about. It's about inspiring people to do stuff. We want, we're not going to be able to um, come up with every great idea, but maybe we can help inspire other people to do it. You know, and so by putting this stuff out in open source and getting people to use our technology and making it something that's flexible and easy to use, we hope that we can inspire people to to do cool stuff and invent the next great thing that there are going to be trillions of instead of billions of. And you know, that would be a good thing. So that's the idea of Sunspots. I left a little bit of time here so that if you guys are interested, I figured there might be a few developers around here. I can sort of show you what the process is like here uh, and do a couple of live demos, which is just a really bad idea, right? You never do things like that. But I'll, I'll go ahead and try it, and we'll, we'll see how it goes here. Um, one of the exciting things about this stuff is that everything is open source. And when I say everything, it's not just the hardware and software. It's even the tools that we use to do this stuff. So um, I use NetBeans, which isn't it's, it's kind of amazing that you've got NetBeans and Eclipse and all these things that are these open source development tools that are out there. Um, we, use, we have tools that we've created for managing sunspots that also are open source. So like here's this one called Solarium that uh, lets you manage these sunspots. So I've got a couple of sunspots here that are running a little program called Bounce. And it uses the accelerometer to once again sense gravity and make these things bounce around. Well, I can do something kind of fun with that, where I can take these and connect them together by pressing the buttons. And they will connect over the radio, theoretically, um, so that the balls can go together. So. Yeah, well, of course, the through the head trick. Yeah, everybody wants to see the through the head trick. All right, all right, yeah. OK, I'll recover. 
we call these the ectoplasmic bouncing balls, and <laughs> that ectoplasm in your brain, it's... Uh... So the cool thing about this is I've, I've got these two devices here, and uh, let's see, I can, I can take one of them and I can, I could, like, uh, let's, let's start another application in here. Let's run something I call Roger Twitter. Okay, so now this application is, this, this Sunspot is running two applications, Spot Bounce and Roger Twitter. And in fact, uh, I'm not sure which one it is, so let's just tell it to uh, blink its LEDs and you guys can see which one it is here. Uh, this guy here, he's our lucky Twitterer. And I've got a little application that just um, will um, basically Twitter the Sunspot Twitters, and, and you know, it Twitters about things that are important to it. You know, I mean, everybody Twitters about such interesting things, of course. Um, where's my mouse here? Let me try and pull up a browser, and let's see what he's Twittering about. <clears throat> now, the idea of having things that are out there in the world that are connecting with stuff in the internet and, and so on, and uh, and, and interacting with the world is, is kind of cool, I think. Oops. And let me just log in here. The name of this, if any of you want to follow this guy he's in the, and see when I do demos, it's Roger Spot. And he just said, hello, I'm awake. I'm on my feet in a place where it's 80 degrees and it's pretty dim here. And so we can do things like uh, we can turn them over and uh, theoretically, or if I can find where my connection is here. Uh, it appears I'm lying on my front. <laughs> I think this is just about as valuable as most Twitter traffic. <laughs> but um, we can do more than that. Anybody know what this is? Yeah, OK, you can read. Great. Does anybody know what semaphore is? This is why you have semaphores in programming languages, because these guys on boats used to swing flags around to send messages to each other. And this one is set up to, uh, it's the same thing as the, as the robot. I've got a couple of servos here, a little pack with batteries, because servos take enough juice that they want to have their own uh, power, and then a sunspot. And the rest is wires and wood and flags and Lego parts, the important stuff. And uh, this guy is set up, if the demo gods are with us, so that he will semaphore out the tweets that that sunspot is sending. And I think, let me uh, start this guy going and make sure <clears throat> I turned everything on. Yeah, really. It's great. It's great fun. I, I actually wrote this last night, so I don't know if it's um, a good thing or not. Normally, when it starts out, there's some lights across the top there. Well, it's the demo effect. Let's take a look and see if we can see what's going on here. Uh, so we've got our sunspots here. And I've got, ah, hang on a second. Let's just, let's just reset this guy. And I can do this remotely, or I can do it from the, um, from the thing there. But I basically have most of the control. I can deploy applications. I can start things, stop things. I can do all that sort of stuff uh, over the air to this. And what I've got is I've got a base station or a sunspot connected to my uh, laptop here. And it talks over the air to this guy. Although I'm just not seeing anything from him. It could be that I killed the batteries. So I apologize for that. But imagine flags waving around and being very amused. <laughs> it's great fun. Anyway, um, this is just uh, to show you that things are relatively easy. And uh, you, can, you can have lots of fun with these, with these gadgets. So with that, I will say that as I mentioned, all this stuff is open source. And you get to us via, come on, next page, 
via this website here called sunspotworld.com. And uh, as long as uh, also spots.dev.java.net is where all the source code is for everything, hardware and software. But with that, I would like to open it up to questions. If any of you have anything you'd like to know about this project, yes. If you're gonna deploy one of these out in the wild, what sort of radio range can you expect, and what sort of uh, solar charging would it take to keep one of these going? Longer? So, uh, so the the question is, uh, thanks. The question is, if you put these out in the wild, how long is the radio range uh, between them, and how much juice do they need if you want to charge them with solar power or something like that? And the answer is um, they get about 100 meters between hops on a good day downhill with the wind behind them. So like inside the building, you won't get 100 meters. But outside, free range, you can get 100 meters uh, if you position them right. And that's between each hop. So you just have to have a spot every 100 meters to get back to where you want. As far as power goes, the power question is a really interesting one. Um, it turns out that the way that these applications work, um, lots of people have built devices like this, but they've made them much simpler, little 8-bit processors, hard to program and all that, but they use less power. And there's this interesting thing that that's, we're looking into here, which is with those 8-bit processors, say you start processing, you, you normally put these things to sleep when you're not using them. So you're asleep, you've got something to do, you wake up, you use some power while you're thinking about it, and then when you're done, you go back to sleep. With a more powerful thing, with a 180 megahertz ARM 9, um, you can, when you wake up, you use a lot more power, but you get an answer a lot faster, and you go back to sleep. And in our case, the difference between being awake and being asleep is at least three orders of magnitude. So the answer to your solar power question is it depends on how often you're sampling. If you're sleeping most of the time, the battery can last years. If you have it on and you're, you're blasting the LEDs at full power and you've got the radio on all the time and, and you're just having a good time you know, calculating pi to the nth digit, <laughs> You're going to run through the batteries in a matter of six hours, eight hours. I mean, you can really, you can really burn through it. So it really depends on your duty cycle. And one of the cool things that we've done with this project is we, because we have Java right on the metal, we can actually control the hardware. And Java is scheduling all the tasks here, so it knows exactly when to wake up and when to go to sleep. And so if you set a timer and say, I need a, you know, I want my task to sleep for, uh, you know, ten for 1,000 milliseconds. It knows that it can go to sleep, and it can wake up just enough time before you need to be awake to get everything up and rolling so that at that time, scheduled time, you're awake and you're going. And we think that if we're really good at this, we can sort of do for power management what Java does for memory management. Right? With memory management, the cool thing about Java is you don't think that much about it. The garbage collector kind of takes care of a lot of stuff for you. Wouldn't it be cool if that worked for power management as well? You just worry about your program, and the system takes care of the power management. So that's one of the research areas that we're looking into. Other questions? Yes? Two things. Uh, do they have embedded flash on there for data logging? Do they have embedded flash on there? Yes, they do. So they have uh, four meg of flash built in, and then we have this uh, extra card that we've built um, that's uh, one of these guys here that uh, has a, an SD card slot on it, so you can actually plug in uh, external memory, uh, you know, and get gigabytes of, of flash if you want. What's the uh, cost per spot? What's the cost per spot? Excellent question. I'm glad you asked. So that kit that's floating around here uh, is the only thing that we sell. Remember, we're this research group, and we don't know how to sell stuff, and so everything's hard, and getting part numbers and things like that is hard. So we have one part number. It's the kit. That's all that we sell, and that kit. Uh, is got, has got the three devices in it and software and these little clips and all, a whole bunch of stuff. And that's $750 commercial. However, there's an education discount. If you know somebody who's in school, you can get it for 300 bucks. And 300 bucks is for three, you know, palm type uh, scale of compute devices is not so bad. Uh, so, so that's that. 
Yes, sir. Do you attach some kind of camera? Can you, can you attach some kind of camera like webcam? Can you attach a camera to it? Um, we have we have not attached a camera to it yet. Um, we've been thinking about doing like one of those CMU cams. They've got a nice serial interface. The e-demo board has a serial interface right built into it. You can take one of the, the pins and make it a UART essentially and, and talk to those sorts of things. So, um, uh, so we've been thinking about stuff like that and haven't had a chance to do it. Uh, actually, the CMU cam isn't the one with the serial interface, but, but anyway. We have not done it. We have a couple of applications that people have come up with that uh, maybe they will do it, or if we get around to it, we've been just swamped with so many ideas and things, we haven't gotten around to that one. But uh, one of the things, there's a, there's a group that wanted to use these for forest fire monitoring. So they wanted to put these things up on a, uh, on a, a watchtower somewhere and have them look out for smoke. And this has got enough processing that they can actually do some simple pattern matching. And if they see, think they see a column of smoke, they can say, hey, there might be smoke out there and uh, trigger things. So, so there's lots of interesting applications like that. The bandwidth of the radio is, they claim 250 k bits per second. Uh, but a lot of that's tied up in overhead and all that. So if you're lucky, you get 150 k bits. You're not going to be streaming video from it. Other questions? Yes, sir. So does it have to be a wait for the mesh communications to work? Does there have to be a wait for the mesh? A wake. A wake. Does it have to be a wake? It, uh, so does it have to be a wake for the mesh communications to work? Uh, yes, at some level. So there's two levels of sleep. There's a deep sleep where you get this thousand-fold decrease in power usage. If you do that, it's shut down. There's a shallow sleep that uses more power but it lets you do things like keep the radio alive during that time, and you can, can manage interrupts and things. So, so kind of no. In this sort of weird in-between limbo state, it can, it can monitor the radio. Yes, in the back. Uh, I was just wondering, can each, uh, sunspot, each sunspot can only have one of those app boards on top? You can actually put, OK, can you put more than one app board on a sunspot? You can put two. So you can, you can stack two boards and exactly two boards, and that's just that we communicate through an SPI bus, and we only have two addresses there that we use. So that's the limitation. But you can put two. Yes, sir. So you mentioned the open sourceness of, of even the hardware and such. Is, are there any third-party vendors right now? Are there any third-party vendors for this, since it is an open source project, even the hardware? So someone just announced. Earlier this week, uh, someone in Hong Kong announced that they're going to start building some of these third-party boards, or these add-on boards, that we are not uh, um, providing because that would be more part numbers and stuff. And <laughs> so so um, they're starting to build some of those. Uh, they are um, building bare boards, and you have to stuff them yourself, unfortunately. So there's a little bit of work involved. but. Uh, uh, that's happening. We certainly have follow-on things like that robot and so on, where people are designing products around this. And we only open source this stuff of, what, like three months ago now. So a lot of people are just going through that decision-making process now. And we've had a fair amount of interest. And that's great, because I don't really want to be in the, in the business of manufacturing little hardware devices. We build big stuff. You know, it's, this, is, this is hard for us. Yes, sir. So the question is, um, we have a focus on wireless. What about wired interfaces? Can we do other things? Um, yes, yeah, so the, the, when you saw the Twitter demo there, what's actually going on is that the base station sunspot, which is just a sunspot main board, that's all a base station is. It's just it's a sunspot without the battery and the the other board uh, is connected via USB to my laptop, and so I'm communicating over USB to that to to my laptop and using that to go over the the Google internet connection to talk to the internet, and so we have that today. Um, we also have uh, the the hardware supports things like. Some, some interesting stuff. Like, right now, this is a USB client. The hardware supports USB host, 
which means you can plug in other USB devices to this. It just requires a lot of software, and we haven't written it. So we have a board in open source that somebody could go and build, but there's no software to support it. So, um, so that's another option. The chip itself actually supports uh, Ethernet. Um, it has an MII interface, so you can you can actually connect into uh, um, uh, you know an Ethernet Phi and and go to town, and so you can connect Wi-Fi and things like that. Um, it's 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 just a matter of software. Um, we also are looking at experimenting around with lots of things come in SD card size packages nowadays, including some wireless communication. And so we're looking at incorporating some of that in. It might be an easy way for us to go without designing a whole lot of hardware. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, what open source license are you using? What open source license are we using? Um, so we have two licenses, the main board and the JVM are under GPL. Everything else, I guess there's a couple of little core pieces that are GPL, and that's mostly because that's the Java license and we had to keep up with that. Everything else is BSD, it's completely open. Do you continue to modify that? So are we, or? Yeah, so are we releasing more versions of the development kit? Yeah, in fact, I'll, I'll show you a cool little uh, thing here. There's this tool, the uh, Sunspot Manager tool, and I can go here and look at the different releases that are out there right now. And in fact, I can go in and uh, go to my preferences and say, uh, I want to look at the beta releases and find out that there's a beta release that just came out a couple of days ago. <coughs> and uh, so we've got that uh, here. And this is the tool that I, that I use. It installs it on. These are all the, the software development kits that are installed on my laptop. These are the ones that are available on the network. Uh, once I install one, I can go to my spots and upgrade them and put that software onto them to match my development kit on my laptop. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's basically how the process works for this. And all these things have um, tons of documentation and so on with them, including tutorials that step you through everything. And so each release has that. What stuff are you developing for later versions of that? So there are some, so right now, uh, a lot, of, we feel like it's, it's, what should I call it? It's feature complete to a certain level, right? You can you can take this and do it, do stuff with yeah. it. It's it's version four of the software. It it, it does stuff. Um, we're looking at longer term things now. We're going back to our research roots and trying to like look at some big things. Like we don't support real time right now. Let's put some real time extensions in here so that we can we can do some stuff uh, quickly and and uh, let's build some infrastructure around this for data collection and databases. Sun bought MySQL, so we've got a project called. Yggdrasil that's uh, a um, Java.net project that grabs data from a network of sunspots, makes it easy to grab data from a network of sunspots and throw it into a, a, a database. So things like that are what we're working on. Yes, sir? Um, I was curious, you, in your example, you showed, uh, we don't have time. You showed uh, two programs running on one of the spots. Yeah. Is there a limit to the number of programs, or how does it handle schedule? Is there a limit to the number of programs that we can run on a spot? Um, we're only limited by memory, so as many as you you want to put in there, you can you can go ahead and put in there. But for like scheduling and, and stuff like that, execution, I mean, you like you're talking practical limits. Well, right. I mean, and, and, like, do you have any? You, you want real world things? I'm talking theory, man. I'm a labs guy. Come on. Uh, no, um, we we run them with you know. You start to see degra degradation. It, it depends. The de how much it degrades depends on what the applications are doing, obviously. And so it's there. There aren't any real limits to that. Um, we can run four or five apps on there, and they can all work. And especially if they sleep all the time, put twenty of them on there. It doesn't matter. Um, but we're not putting hundreds of them on there. We've never tried that. Not saying it won't work, just haven't tried it. All right, so any other questions? Then, oh, one more, last question, all right. Yes, there's no operating system, so how do you switch between the programs? 
It's all in Java. Java, 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 Java. Didn't you, did, were you here for that part of the talk? Java, 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 Java. So this, this, what we've done is we've taken a Java virtual machine, uh, and it's called Squawk, um, and we've added some sort of operating system type extensions to it to let you look at tasks as objects. So you can take a task and tell it to suspend or resume. You can tell it to start running. You can get a list of them. You can do things like that. And so you have some sort of um, things that are, that are very much like uh, um, operating system kinds of functions that are being carried out by the VM. OK, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. <laughs>